Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. It all started when I was invited to a ski trip with my friends in the Rocky Mountains. We had been planning this trip for months and were excited to hit the slopes and enjoy some much needed relaxation. I was in my last semester of college and I was feeling overwhelmed with all the responsibilities I had. I had to study for final exams, complete my capstone project, and start looking for a job after graduation. I was also trying to spend time with my friends and family before we all went our separate ways. It was a lot to juggle, and I wasn't sure how I was going to make it through. My best friend, Rachel, is an avid skier, and she had been trying to convince me to go skiing with her for years. I'd always been hesitant because I was afraid of falling and getting injured, but Rachel promised me that she would take it slow and teach me the proper techniques. I was thankful for the generous offer of taking her training class, but it was the R&R &R that I was looking forward to the most. I gathered everything I thought I would need on this trip and packed it into my suitcase. I made sure to bring enough clothes for the duration of the trip, as well as my toiletries and any necessary documents. I also packed some snacks and drinks for the journey just in case. I double-checked my packing list to make sure I didn't forget anything important. Then I zipped up my suitcase and lugged it to the front door. I was ready to embark on this adventure, and I couldn't wait to see my friends and have fun on the slopes and a little rest and relaxation. It was a monumentous occasion. For all of us, as we gathered at the airport, excited to embark on this adventure together. Rachel, Julia, Kim, Douglas, Victor, and I were all eager to explore the breathtaking beauty of the mountains and create memories that would last a lifetime. As we waited for takeoff, we chatted and laughed, already feeling the bond of friendship that had brought us all together. The anticipation of what was to come only added to the excitement, and we knew that this trip was going to be one for the books. Rachel's parents had generously offered us the use of their stunning vacation home for the duration of our trip, and we were eager to take them up on their kind offer. Nestled only a few miles from the slopes, the vacation home was the perfect base for us to explore all that the mountainous playground had to offer. With its cozy fireplace, comfortable bedroom, and fully equipped kitchen, we knew that we would have everything we needed to relax and recharge after a long day on the slope. We were grateful for the opportunity to stay in such a beautiful and welcoming place and couldn't wait to make ourselves at home. As we stepped off the plane and into the airport, I felt a wave of excitement wash over me. I had always wanted to visit the Rocky Mountains, and now, finally, my dream was becoming a reality. We gathered our luggage and made our way outside to the rental car shuttle. The crisp mountain air filled my lungs, and I couldn't help but smile as we all boarded the shuttle. The drive to the house in the woods was breathtaking. The majestic peaks of the Rockies loomed in the distance, dusted with a layer of fresh, powdery snow. I couldn't wait to hit the slopes and experience the thrill of skiing in such a beautiful setting. As we turned on to the winding road that led to the house, I felt my anticipation growing. The house, nestled among the trees, was exactly as I had pictured it in my mind and how Rachel had described it. I couldn't wait to explore the surrounding woods and take in all the natural beauty that the Rockies had to offer. 
With a sense of excitement and adventure in my heart, we pulled up to the house and parked the car. I was ready to make the most of my trip to the Rocky Mountains, and I knew that it was going to be a trip to remember. It was dark by the time we unloaded our suitcases and settled into the house. The long drive from the airport had left us all exhausted, but we were excited to finally be at our destination. The house was small, but it was perfect for our group of friends. We spent the evening unpacking and getting settled, chatting and laughing as we caught up after being apart for four long years. We met in high school, and after graduation, we all chose different colleges to go to. Being back together again was truly a blessing. As the night wore on, we started a fire in the fireplace and settled in for the night, eager to get a good night's sleep before hitting the slopes in the morning. I couldn't wait to wake up and explore the beautiful surroundings of the house. The Rocky Mountains were a place I'd always dreamed of visiting, and I was thrilled to finally be here with my friends by my side. It was going to be an unforgettable trip. As I readied myself for bed, suddenly, a wave of fear washed over me. It was a strange sensation, and I couldn't quite put my finger on why it was happening. I tried to brush it off and tell myself it was just my imagination, but the feeling persisted. I glanced around the room, trying to see if there was anything out of the ordinary that could be causing the sensation. But everything seemed normal. The room felt cozy enough, and the large windows cast an outside glow from the full moon. My suitcase was unpacked, and my clothes were neatly put away. There was nothing out of place. As I looked out the large window, I tried to see what was outside in the dark. I noticed that the snow on the ground was glittering in the moonlight, creating a peaceful scene. After taking a moment to scan the area, I was satisfied that there was nothing or no one near the window. However, as I turned to close the curtains, I thought I saw a large shadow pass by the corner of the house. My heart skipped a beat as I quickly shut the curtains and stood in place, startled. When I mustered the courage to look outside again, there was nothing there. I tried to shake off the feeling of being spooked and attributed it to my imagination playing tricks on me. The day on the slopes had been truly amazing, and I was grateful to have experienced it with such a wonderful group of friends. Although I had been a bit nervous at first, the beauty of the Rocky Mountains and the support of my friends had quickly put me at ease. We spent hours skiing and snowboarding, reveling in the exhilaration of the sport and the stunning views, taking breaks to warm up with hot cocoa and snacks only added to the enjoyment, and I couldn't help but feel grateful for the opportunity to be there. Even though from time to time the stress of going back to reality would creep in, I tried to push it to the back of my mind and enjoy every moment of our trip. As we made our way back to the house in the woods, the sun was beginning to set, casting a golden glow over the landscape. I was exhausted, but exhilarated. I couldn't wait to get inside, change out of my ski gear, and relax by the fire. But as we approached the house, we all noticed something strange. There were huge footprints in the snow surrounding the house and then disappearing into the woods. They were much too large to be human, and they seemed to be everywhere. My heart raced as I tried to think of what could have made such massive prints. We cautiously made our way inside, keeping a very close eye on the windows and doors. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was watching us. As we settled in for the night, I wondered what could have left those massive footprints in the snow. I remembered the large shadow from the last night and told the others, and that's when I really became spooked. 
I thought I saw something too, exclaimed Julia as she covered her mouth with her hand. You saw something or someone outside our house and didn't tell us? questioned Victor in a somewhat angry tone of voice. I only saw what I thought might be a shadow, but I assumed it may have been a shadow of a large bush beside the house. I told them as my voice cracked. That night, I drifted off to sleep fairly quickly. With the day's activities, I was exhausted. I fell into a deep sleep when suddenly I was jarred awake by a huge thump that vibrated throughout the house. I jumped out of bed and noticed that everyone in the house was awake and had exited their bedroom. I could hear their voices coming from the hallway as I swung out my bedroom door and joined them. We all followed into the kitchen and discussed our experience. Could it have been an avalanche? Kim asked in a nervous voice. No, Kim, Douglas replied with a sarcastic tone. An avalanche did not hit the house. It's not close enough to the mountain to be affected by one. He shook his head in disbelief that Kim had asked such a silly question. What could it have been? Victor chimed in. It jarred me pretty good, and my bed moved at least an inch, he continued, as he held his hand up to show the distance. Well, I don't know what it was, Rachel started to say, when another loud thump vibrated throughout the small house. Startled, we all froze in place and looked at each other in shock. This time, the thump was even louder and more powerful. We have to find out what's going on, Douglas said, as his voice shook with fear. Maybe it's just the wind or something, but we can't just sit here and do nothing. I agree, Rachel said, her face grim. We need to find out what's causing these thumps and make sure we're safe. We all nodded in agreement and quickly made our way to the door, our hearts pounding in our chests. We had no idea what we would find outside, but we knew we had to face it together. As we stepped out into the cold night air, we were met with a sight we would never forget. There, standing just a few feet away from the house, was a massive, hulking figure. It was covered in fur, and had glowing eyes that seemed to pierce through the darkness. What is that? Kim screamed out in fear as she pointed, her shaking finger at the massive creature. It was Bigfoot. We stood there, frozen in shock and fear, as the creature let out a deafening roar. We were rooted to the spot, unsure of what to do. The creature seemed to be watching us, sizing us up. Then, without warning, it turned and lumbered away, into the darkness, disappearing into the woods. We all stood there, stunned as we watched it go. We couldn't believe what we had just seen. Finally, we snapped out of our trance and ran back into the house, locking the door behind us. What was that? Kim gasped, her face pale and her hands trembling by her side as she rapidly breathed in air. It was a big foot, I said, my voice shaking. I can't believe it, but it was definitely a big foot. We all sat there in silence, trying to process what had just happened. It was a surreal and terrifying experience, one that we would never forget. The rest of the night passed in a blur. We stayed up, huddled together, too scared to sleep. We knew that a Bigfoot was out there, somewhere, and we didn't want to risk it coming back. As the first rays of dawn peeked through the window, we finally allowed ourselves to drift off to sleep. It was a fitful and uneasy sleep, but at least we were safe. And when we woke up the next morning, we knew that we had to leave. We packed our bags and fled the cabin never to look back. It was an experience that we would never forget, and one that we would never want to repeat. We drove back to the airport in a tense and quiet car ride. None of us were quite sure what to say about what had happened. It was a surreal and terrifying experience, one that was difficult to put into words. When we finally arrived home, we were relieved to be back in the familiar surroundings of our own lives. 
but we knew that we would never be able to forget about that night in the woods and the creature that had terrorized us. I tried to move on and put the experience behind me, but it was impossible to forget. Every time I heard a strange noise or saw a shadowy figure in the distance, I couldn't help but wonder if it was a Bigfoot. It was a memory that would stay with us forever, a reminder of the unknown and the mysteries that lurk in the world around us. On to the next one. In Fountain County in Indiana, at 5.50 a.m. on November, a deer hunter was standing in his tree stand holding a 12-gauge rifle barrel shotgun when suddenly he heard a deep, evil-sounding voice. It sounded like a demon taking deep breaths amplified in comparison to anything he had ever heard. After two deep exhales, it started to snort and bellow. He looked in the direction in which the sound was coming from and caught a glimpse of a dark figure, about seven to nine feet tall, standing upright. As he looked at it, through his rifle scope, it bellowed even louder. The hunter quickly left the area, but heard similar sounds 20 minutes later. On to the next one. In Dallas County in Iowa, my house sits in front of a rather large patch of timber. Our freshman year of high school just got out for summer vacation, and we were celebrating in the timber at the campout. It was just getting dark outside, so we decided to build the fire. The four of us finished our suppers and were sitting around the fire just talking. Soon, it was pitch black outside, and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We got out our flashlight and decided to go to the tent we had set up earlier. The next thing that happened, I'm not really sure about what time it was, but it was still very dark out. We all woke up to the sound of rustling leaves. We assumed it was just a raccoon eating the leftover scraps of food. But then there was a strange grunting sound, sounding like some sort of sick cow or something and heavy, raspy breathing. Also, there was a reeking stench, almost like rotten eggs. We all thought it was somebody playing a prank on us, but in the middle of the night, and how would they find us out in the middle of the woods? We all went out of the tent to look around. Sure, it was just nothing. As we unzipped the tent, the rustling stopped and the breathing slowed down a little. As we poked our heads out of the opening, we caught a glimpse of him. I'm still not sure of what I saw that night. In proportion to the tree, he was standing near when we saw him. His head came close to hitting the branch, which seems to be a little less than seven feet tall. He was hairy and had reddish brown fur. Once the four of us talked about what we saw, we all had seen the same thing. A glimpse of him walking away. I think he seemed maybe a little afraid of us, for whatever reason, I don't know. He was too far away to distinctly see his eyes. All I can tell you is that we only saw his backside, reddish-brown fur, and very tall. The woods we were in are located about 10 to 15 miles west of Des Moines. I don't know how I could tell you to get the exact spot where we were camping, though. I know approximately where. The timber is very thick back in there, so it's hard to say. The timber is behind my house, so it shouldn't be hard to find. As for food, he could have been attracted to. We had leftover bags of potato chips, hot dogs, buns, s'mores, some fresh fruit. I can't think of anything else at this moment, but just general snacks and food for our open campfire. His body was pretty strange, as to the proportion question. Big hands, most likely big feet too. Tall and large biceps and upper leg muscles from what I could tell. And long hair covered his whole body from what we could see. I can't remember a lot more about this creature. He or she, I suppose, seemed very frightened. 
at the sight of humans. He wasn't afraid of the campfire, it seemed, although it was just smoke by this time. My guess was that he was attracted to the fruit most likely. The fruit was the strongest smelling piece of food we had. On to the next one. In Jasper County in Iowa, there was a lot of cover in this timber, close to South Gunk River, and corn and bean fields. I had my first encounter years ago. I lived at the time at my parents' house. Me and my cousin were chilling on this log in a ravine, talking, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw his dog chasing a rabbit. Then, when I looked back a couple of minutes later, I saw the rabbit chasing the dog. I thought this was strange, but I didn't think anything of it. We headed back up the hill to the gate, and when I shut the gate and ready to lock it up, that's when we heard this blood-gurgling growl and howl. We both looked at each other and ran down the hill and jumped the electrical fence and up the hill by our grandpa's building. I looked back, and there it was. So tall, and it stared at us for about 20 seconds. Then I saw him turn and head back down into the woods. About two years ago, I found the stick structure shed while I was hunting, which looked out of place and odd. Last year when deer hunting, I'd seen this thing run through the woods and heard branches breaking while leaning on a tree waiting for deer. I was very frightened, and I didn't want to move. South Skunk River is close to our place, too. We were down in a ravine in the timber by a pond. I also noticed that the stick structure looked like a bedding area. It was in the afternoon around lunchtime, partly sunny. The second time I saw this figure was early morning, watching deer in preparation for deer hunting. I had been out one hour to one and a half hours watching deer when I heard the crunch breaking sound and thought it was a deer. I saw a red, black colored figure on all four legs running. The distance was about 75 to 80 yards away. On to the next one. In Pottawatomie County in Iowa. My name is Todd. Myself and a friend, Brian, went camping at Wilson Island State Park. This park is connected to Desto Bend National Wildlife Refuge in Iowa. Well, here is my account of what happened. It was approximately 2.25 a.m. when I was awakened by the sound of footsteps in the dry leaves. It circled my tent, then stopped directly behind my head. Being half awake, I assumed it was my friend, Brian, getting up to go to the bathroom in the bushes. But then I heard the sound of Brian unzipping his tent, and so I realized it wasn't Brian. When I jumped up to go outside of my tent, whatever was standing behind my tent took off, plowing through the trees heading to the Missouri River, which was about 300 meters from our campsite. Anyway, when we both climbed out of our tent, we were afraid because Brian thought I was walking around his tent trying to scare him. When we realized we were both inside our tent at the same time, it gave us a very spooky feeling. I guess what bothered us the most was that we were the only people in this campground. We pondered the possibility of it being a hunter. But why would a hunter be out at 2.55 a.m. in a state park? Well, neither one of us saw anything but I've never felt like that before. The whole night, we both felt like we were being watched. Prior to this incident, at around 8 p.m., we heard a couple of screams. It kind of sounded like a woman crying or the sound a rabbit makes when it's getting killed. Also, it was very quiet and still. We didn't see anything, but we both heard the heavy footsteps around our campsite. I mean, they were so great that they woke us up I heard years ago that a truck driver saw something cross the highway by Esterville, Iowa. They said it had brownish-orange hair and was six feet tall. It was very early morning, 2.55 a.m. It was a clear night, no moon, very mild temperatures for December, 
about 32 degrees, dark and no wind. The environment has some floodplains, but mostly tall cottonwood forest with lots of underbrush with creeks and pond. It's about eight miles west of Lois Hill. On to the next one. Hello, my name is Andrew, and I'm from a very rural town in Oklahoma known as Carmen. I'm 24 years old. So, all of this happened back when I was 22. There isn't a whole lot going on in my hometown, so whenever there's something that causes the tiniest bit of excitement, it feels like the entire community gets involved. The town started getting all worked up once domesticated dogs started to disappear from properties. It was always dogs that were left to roam their respective yards that it seemed like ended up vanishing into thin air. There were never any bodies found, which led to a lot of people believing that somebody was going around dealing dogs that they suspected might have been abused and needed a better home. But it got to the point where it started happening so regularly that the theory started to dissolve. The population of domesticated canines was dropping so rapidly that people who still did have their dogs started to keep them inside nearly 24 hours a day. I remember how there was one man who claimed that he saw a devil leap into his neighbor's yard and snap their dog's neck, and then ran off with the body in an instant. There were a handful of very religious folks who seemed to believe this claim. However, many others began to acknowledge him as little more than a crazy old man. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, you would be woken up by the sounds of firing of a rifle. It wasn't like that had never happened before. After all, coyotes did frequent the area. And sometimes, folk would fire a shot into the air to scare them off. But it started happening at such a high rate that people who never had any dogs of their own started to complain about all of the noise. The disappearance of these dogs created so much controversy among the residents within the town. The mystery had gone on for so long that there became this unwritten rule to refrain from speaking of it. Unfortunately, that didn't prevent the horror from continuing. I had this one close friend, Kristen, who had become very intrigued in the matter. She was this cool individual who shared many of the same interests as me while growing up. She called me over one day because she claimed to have seen the animal that she suspected was responsible for the dog abduction. <laughs> she had been trying to capture both photographs and footage of the animal, but as you might expect, it never really worked out. Kristen invited me over to her place one night to kick it and wait for this animal to appear. I remember I wasn't all that interested, for whatever reason, but she was able to persuade me with a thick pack of beer. Shortly after I arrived there, I watched Kristen's older brother place a bunch of raw strip steak in various places around their backyard. The three of us had a good time that night, but saw nothing. I believe it was the following weekend when I went back and did a similar routine. Only this time, her brother thought it would be a better idea to hang the meat from a few of the large trees that you could see from their backyard. We had a few beers and were sitting around a space near one of their windows that was lit by nothing more than a handful of candles. It wasn't even that late in the night that we saw movement near their trees. At first, I thought we were looking at a mere coyote, a large one, but a coyote nonetheless. But it was when we watched it stand up on two feet and extend an arm way above its head to grab a piece of strip stick that I knew this was unlike anything I'd ever known to exist. Christian's brother, Jim, explained that he hung the meat high up there so that it would instantly prove that this was no normal dog. Unlike other encounters I've heard and read, 
This creature didn't appear overly muscular or anything like that. From where we were sitting, I don't think it was any larger than the average adult man. Because of all the other reports talking about how massive these things can get, I wouldn't be at all surprised if what we were looking at was a juvenile. In a way, that almost makes it more frightening. If it was just a juvenile that was capable of capturing and likely consuming that many dogs, imagine what the full-grown adult dogmen are capable of. I've never seen one of those, and I certainly hope I never do. We watched the supposed juvenile animal for a few minutes before it scampered away. Each of us was shooting footage and snapping photos with our phones, but all of it was too dark to use as proof. Jim didn't set up any lights near the tree at that time because he had convinced himself that a light setup would drastically decrease the chances of being able to attract the animal. So the animal was there, biting at the meat for a few minutes and sniffing around the area before it eventually wandered off back into the dark. It wasn't much longer after that that people seemed to stop seeing this creature and the remaining dogs stayed out of harm's way. I'm sure a lot of that is because people were exercising caution by keeping their dogs close and inside most of the time. Therefore, the animal might have become discouraged by the lack of available food compared to what there once was and decided to move to a different area. I strongly believe it was a rare type of humanoid that I saw that night but there were a few people that I knew who were very convinced that they're spirits of some kind. I think it might have been due to the notion that they have had so much trouble capturing any imagery of the creature, even when it was in plain sight. But there's plenty of documented wildlife out there that is also very challenging to photograph, even for professionals. Sure, they're not quite as challenging, but... There are very few of these dogmen roaming the earth. It's understandable why it's no easy task. On to the next one. Hello, my name is Tess, and I grew up an only child. You've probably never visited Lake Village in Arkansas, but if you have, you might know there's not much to do there other than walk through the woods or swim during the warmer month. I grew up just outside Little Rock, but we'd drive to Grandma Beverly's house on Lake Village on the weekends and holidays, back when she was still around. I know this will probably be hard for many people to believe, but nearly every time I was at my grandma's place, I would encounter a little girl who looked just like me. I remember seeing her for the first time when I was four years old, and I suppose I never thought it was weird or anything, because I never saw my guardians behave like anything was unusual. Our brains are so underdeveloped at that age that we don't perceive so many things that don't make much sense. Therefore, I always thought that my parents, grandmother, and her friends were aware of that little girl who looked like she could be my twin. I didn't think much of it back then, but it was strange how she would tend to stay in the corners of my room observing my every move. It didn't become clear to me until years later that nobody else saw her when we'd play together. Another reason I don't think my family paid much attention when I spoke to the girl was that I referred to her as Tess, though so everyone probably assumed I was acting goofy and using my imagination like most typical small children. I don't remember the girl telling me her name, but she never seemed to mind when I would call her Tess. There were several occasions when my parents or grandma would tuck me in for the night and Tess would tap on the bedroom window after they exited the room and closed the door. Sometimes she would stand out there for hours watching me. I don't remember inviting her inside, for she always came in and out of the house at will. Nothing about our early interactions frightened me. It felt akin to spending time with other children from my hometown. The only difference was this one looked identical to me, 
which I thought was pretty cool. What kid wouldn't? Another strange aspect of my story is how the little girl always wore outfits similar to mine. Her clothes were contemporary. If she were a ghost from the past, I expect her clothing to look outdated. I guess there's a chance I was too young to ponder her outfit, but I feel I would have remembered it had she been dressed old-fashioned. That wasn't even something I thought of until many years later. I remember how things started to feel off the first time I woke up to my doppelganger hanging from the ceiling directly above my bed. But she wasn't hanging from a noose. She clung to it with her fingers. What are you doing up there? I whispered. She didn't reply. I couldn't see her eyes from that angle, so I wasn't sure she was watching me or somehow asleep up there. I should mention that I had never seen any horror movies or read any scary stories before that point, so I didn't feel outright terrified. I merely felt that something was a bit off, as crazy as that might sound. Nowadays, if I were to wake up to something like that, I'd probably dive through the window to get away as quickly as possible. I again asked the little girl what she was doing up there, but she remained quiet. Why aren't you answering me? I said. Are you okay? Again, no response whatsoever. Now, I started to feel even more nervous and worried for my friend. I shouted for my parents to see if they could help. Mom, Dad, I hollered which triggered an immediate response from my little lookalike. I'll never forget how she hissed at me as her neck lengthened and brought her face closer to mine. Her mouth widened and her eyes were as black as a never-ending abyss. That marked the first time I experienced paralyzing fear, something I didn't even know existed before then. Honey, what is it? My dad said as he ripped the door open and rushed inside. I can't even begin to tell you how glad I was he was there. Make her go away, I cried, hiding under the blanket. Make her go away. Make who go away? I heard my mom's voice say. She must have entered the room seconds after my dad. Look up, I said. Look up at what, sweetie? My dad asked. I slowly lowered the blanket below my eyes, thinking I'd have an easier time pointing her out, but she was no longer on the ceiling. She was just up there, I shouted, dressed by the idea that she had gotten away. Honey, you just had a bad dream, my dad said. That's what's called a nightmare. We all get them from time to time. No, it wasn't a dream, I protested. Tess is being mean. I couldn't help but cry. I never wanted to see my lookalike again. I suddenly felt so surprised for ever having trusted her. It felt like I had been playing with a wild animal and had gotten lucky that it hadn't attacked. Please don't leave me alone, I begged. My parents were very loving, but they had been strict about me sleeping in my own room ever since I could remember. They believed it was critical for my development to start learning independence as early as possible. They must have read it in some parenting guide or heard it from their friends. Typically, I was very obedient and responded well to their structured ways of raising me. But this night was a different story. I demanded that at least one of them stay with me in my room, or I went to their room. Eventually, they submitted, and I followed them to their bedroom. I remember my father getting annoyed because the bed was already too small for the two of them, and the addition of me made him hang off the side of it. I've had it. My dad muttered after a few minutes of trying to get comfortable. Frustrated, he plopped his pillow onto the carpeted floor and tried to get comfortable. Although I began to feel much safer, things got weird again when I awoke to my father's voice instructing me to get back into bed. Initially, I was confused. I figured he must have been having a bad dream. When I peeked my head over the edge of the mattress, I found my dad lying in the fetal position with his eyes half open. Daddy, what's wrong? I asked, which startled him so much that he jumped to his feet. What the heck? He shrieked. Who's under there? I had never seen my father lose his composure like that. Something about it made me feel incredibly vulnerable. 
I think of that moment of the first time I realized that my parents, especially my dad, aren't indestructible superheroes I once thought they were. Mitchell, what is it? My mom said sitting up in bed. There's someone under the bed, my dad muttered, seemingly in disbelief at the words coming from his mouth. I thought it was Tess, but she's right there. My mom sighed with relief, seemingly establishing that my dad had had a bad dream. She probably figured that he had some strange nightmare based on what I had said while they were talking to me in my room. Seeing that I was with my parents, I felt significantly more comfortable about my lookalike being around. I felt confident that she wouldn't be able to harm me while under their watch. I looked at it the same way another child might while standing between their parents when the school bully is around. They wouldn't dare lay a finger on me while mom and dad are present. So I leaned and lifted the corner of the blankets that obstructed my view beneath the bed. I immediately regretted doing that. My dad hollered and jumped to his feet as my doppelganger lunged out from under the bed and crawled toward him like a spider. His reaction alone caused both my mom and me to scream. Then chaos ensued. I hid under the sheet while my mother's hand fumbled to grasp at the lamp switch. It wasn't long before I heard my grandma's voice asking what all the commotion was about from just outside the door, but she couldn't even finish her sentence before she shrieked, indicating that she'd also laid eyes on the strangeness. I felt another body land on top of the mattress before I threw the sheets off me, slid off the edge of the bed, and landed very awkwardly on one of my shoulders. A moment later, the light finally came on, and I immediately noticed that my dad was bleeding from a wound near his collarbone. Everything was happening so fast, making it difficult to know what to do. Soon, I heard the bedroom door close, and I peeked my head above the mattress to find my mom with her back against it. Everyone, including my dad, had tears in their eyes, and their rapid breathing indicated that their heart rates were through the roof. Sit down, my mom said to my grandma, gesturing for her to sit in an old wooden chair beneath an even older looking desk. I could tell that everyone wanted to ask what had just happened, but they were still trying to accept what they had just seen as reality. I'm sorry, I murmured, feeling an odd sense of guilt. In some strange way, I felt as though I was to blame for everything because of how the attacker resembled me. Honey, don't be silly, my father said, while trying to examine his wound. This has nothing to do with you, but I remember thinking his voice suggested he wasn't entirely sure of that. He just wanted to believe it. My grandma extracted multiple tissues from a box atop the wooden desk and handed them to my dad. He thanked her and asked if there was a landline telephone anywhere in the room. He was too low to the ground to see the entirety of the space. There isn't, my grandma replied, sounding regretful for having decided it wasn't necessary to put a telephone in that room. Check your cell phone, Dad suggested to my mom. But you know we never have reception out here, she replied. Can you please just check, he said, losing his patience. I could tell he was trying to ignore the pain above his chest, but it was becoming more challenging by the second. My mom quietly stepped over to her backpack and extracted the mobile device. Nope, nothing, she said, shaking her head. My dad cursed under his breath. My grandma had just begun to speak when a soft tapping at the door cut her off mid-sentence. I've always wondered if that was even my lookalike doing that. I don't know who else or what else it could have been, but it just doesn't seem consistent for her to have been the one to do it. She had always seemed to appear at will. Had she wanted to get back inside the bedroom, I don't see why she would have felt the need to request someone to let her in. But I suppose there's always the chance that she was merely trying to intimidate my family. It is impossible to say what that was all about. When the tapping stopped moments later, my mother asked the others if we should try to exit through the window. Although my grandmother lived in a one-story ranch-style home, the guest room was a little higher above ground 
due to a minor decline in the yard right outside. The drop-off wouldn't be enough to kill anyone, but it would have undoubtedly been a challenge for someone as feeble as my grandma to navigate. It was difficult to imagine her climbing down from there without at least breaking an ankle. Then, what would everyone do? I felt bad for saying it, but my grandma was heavy set and had a hard enough time walking around as it was. There was no way my father could have effectively assisted her if she attempted to climb out the window, especially while nursing his fresh injury. After a few minutes of listening for signs of my creepy counterpart, my mom asked grandma to swap places with her so that she could examine dad's wound. Not long after they switched, my mother, father, and I swiveled our head toward the sound of the door swinging open and out stepped my grandma. She hadn't announced that she was going out there, likely because she knew my family would stop her, but it was clear she felt a duty to protect her loved ones, especially in her home. I'm coming for you, you little demon, grandma yelled, charging down the hall as fast as she could, attempting to sound intimidating. I'll never forget how she referred to my doppelganger as a little demon. I'll always wonder if that's what she thought it was, or if she just wanted to call it something derogatory. Wisely, Mom used that opportunity to open the window. She was the first to jump out, holding her hands out while my dad passed me to her. I remember him grimacing as he picked me up. Even something as light as my body weight felt overbearing for his damaged muscles. Hurry, my mom commanded of my dad once I was safely at her side. It was right when he had begun to climb down that we heard grandma scream several times. It sounded like she was in agony. Had I not been their primary concern, there's no way my parents would have been willing to leave my grandmother to deal with the intruder. However, the last thing they wanted was for her noble sacrifice to be in vain. I'm so sorry, my mother sobbed looking at the house. Please, Mom, stay strong for us. My family drove to the police station as quickly as possible. We didn't even know where it was, so we went to the nearest town. Fortunately, we found it quick. My dad immediately told the officer at the desk there was an aggressive intruder at my grandma's house, and they didn't hesitate to dispatch police to check things out. They then focused on my dad's wound and called for medical assistance. The rest of that night is a blur but I vaguely remember my mom getting very heated when she felt like the police weren't buying her story. I'm sure just the idea that we were attacked by what looked to be a little girl was difficult enough to believe, let alone that it was a ghost or a demon. Not long after arriving at the station, we learned that the police had discovered my deceased grandmother lying in the laundry room. The authorities claimed not to have found any damage to her body other than bruises that they blamed on falling after suffering a stroke. I'm not sure whether my parents ever got another look at her body after that night, but even if they had, much of her body would have been covered, so it's not like they could have verified if the coroner had told the truth. But it's also difficult to imagine them having much of a reason to fib about that. The only minor potentiality I can come up with is that they don't want to appear incompetent if they feel stumped. My family began attending church every Sunday after that awful night. Moving forward, we have spoken very little about what occurred that night. I've gotten the sense that at least one of my parents concluded it's best to disregard whatever attacked us in case doing so somehow provokes it. I'll forever wonder why my lookalike appeared identical and was only visible to me for a long time. What was it doing with me? And why did it seem interested only in me until later when it decided to attack? I suppose you have to accept that there are some things you'll never get to the bottom of. I'll never forget your sacrifice, Grandma. You are one of the most selfless souls I've ever known. On to the next one. I grew up in Bangor, Maine, and my father was a junior partner in a sporting goods business. I cannot mention the company because my dad's retirement club prohibits the use of the name. I'll simply say that father had worked for the same company 
think he graduated from college, so there were a lot of perks. I mentioned this only to say our family benefited from those bonuses, myself probably more than the rest, even though I'm female. Since my brother had joined one of the major auto manufacturing corporations in the United States, I happily filled the spot that normally would have been for a male in the corporate succession ladder. I soon realized that being a girl, I was a token figure primarily useful for public relations, although I doubt I was taken as seriously as a man would have been. I purely loved traveling with father as I was introduced to some of the most terrific boarding personalities in the world. Over a period of several summers prior to entering college, I attended what were known as high-level meetings, where my opinion was often thought so as to represent the company's fast-growing product segment that catered towards the female sports person. My big break came during my second year of college as the company was opening several more franchises in Canada, and they made me an offer thanks to dad's influence, I admit, but I will also admit to being a perfect fit for the position. This was too good an opportunity, so I took a break from school so I could see what would be required knowledge for my new position when I continued my schooling, which the company offered to pay for. My first assignment was to move to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and my fellow employees were marvelous. They took me under their wings like a member of their family, and I assimilated quickly. The company had taken my advice and closed the deal for our newest franchise, so my job was now to totally devote my time to ensure that we gave our full support to the success of this brand new location. I know I'm rambling, but the memories of those days are so rewarding that I get caught up, so let me get to my experience with the scariest animal I've ever seen. Several of us employees began to bond soon after we first met, and before long, we were a close circle of eight people with similar interests. Our main organizer, Paul, had been with this group for a long time before they became our franchise, and being the newcomer to the team, I was satisfied to merely be part of the fun. Before long, we had narrowed down to an almost inseparable six people. We had many common interests, but... Our main hobby was sailing. Here's where I finally get my story out. On a boating jaunt on my friend Jeannie's father's yacht, her dad took us on a four-day trip from his moorage in Dartmouth, and we met a business associate from Sydney and Port Hawkesbury, which was a point between where they were purchasing a piece of land at the port facility. Jeannie and I hung around on the yacht, and the second day, we were heading back towards Halifax when Jeannie's dad got a call from a real estate developer saying he wanted to meet him at the Mahone Bay to discuss a real estate development at Oak Island. Back then, this place had not received the notoriety it has today. It was just a small island off the coast near Lindenburg. Sure, we knew the place had been the topic of a lot of stories about pirate treasure and strange happenings and I hadn't lived in that area long enough to learn much about it. But also, I had zero interest in exploring for old coins and digging in holes where snakes lived. Anyway, we soon dropped anchor off a small island about 600 to 1,000 feet from shore. There was a small marina-like area on the mainland with a parking lot for vehicles and docks evidently for visitors and the people who had homes that I could see the roofs of as the island was higher than our deck. Jeannie and I didn't pay much attention as a small powerboat picked up her dad and left for Oak Island. One of its crewmen went along with the other two remaining on the boat with us. We were swaying slightly and the anchor rope had enough play in it that soon we were floating close enough to get a clear look at the shoreline. The ship's binoculars clearly made for close-ups of the flags and stakes where the lot for sale were stretched out from the house and some other buildings of which we could only see a roof because of the island's height. I think I must have been watching long enough to have been half asleep when I became aware of an animal moving in the overgrown weed down along the shore. I looked over at Jeannie 
and she was stumped over, sound asleep. I shook her awake and whispered for her to look, and as she turned to where I was pointing, another, much bigger animal joined the first one. They just stood there eating berries from the bushes. I assumed them to be raspberries or similar, but I suddenly woke up enough to realize I was not looking at an animal I was familiar with. These were not normal wildlife. Jeannie finally broke from her trance-like state, and as she turned to me, she said, Sasquatch. As we both watched through our binoculars, the animals didn't seem as though they were even aware of our being there. Of course, the ever-present wind blew constantly across this vast waterway. Then, as we were staring open-mouthed, Jeannie's dad came over the hill with the man and his crewman. Her dad and the man in the suit shook hands, and the man went back up the hill as her dad returned to the boat. He was soon at the yacht, and, as the boat was raised to its fling, we regaled her dad on the animals we had just watched. Jeannie's dad joined us on deck, and, as he was served a scotch by his white, frocked crewman, he settled into a lounge chair as we continued our story. When we finally ran out of breath, her dad filled me in on why he hadn't thought to tell me that I may see one of these Sasquatch. He said the locals accept them, and seldom had there been any problems with the big animal. They never had any confrontation because the beast seemed terrified when coming upon people, but they weren't scared enough to stay away when the berries were ripe. The locals kept silent about the Sasquatch because they were known to be in several better publicized areas nearby, and the islanders didn't want trespassers and their cameras anywhere near. As our boat powered away, I took one last look back, but there was no sign of the creatures. Evidently, there were a great number of areas in that wild country where colonies of them lived all year round in harmony with the local people. On to the next one. My name is Tanner. I grew up near Telluride, and I was a true ski bum for a number of years. I would do anything to ski, which included sleeping, i.e. freezing, in my car, working in ski rental shops, couch surfing, washing dishes, you name it. Anything so I could ski, which I love. I finally got on the ski patrol there, which was a dream job in some ways, though the pay wasn't that great. A bunch of us rented a three-bedroom apartment and managed to get by. I think there were six of us living there, and I got the couch for the reduced rent. But we didn't care where we lived. We were all ski bums. I gradually decided I should move on and get some job skills, so I left Telluride when I was in my late 20s and moved to Grand Junction, where I got a career job with the Department of Wildlife. That was great because I was still outside a lot, but now I had some job security and a decent wage. I stayed there until I recently retired. But this event happened in Telluride, and I've never seen anything like what I saw that day, even though I'm outside a lot. In a way, it's kind of funny, though at the time, I was terrified. I had managed to wrangle a job that summer with the ski area working as a lift operator. It was a pretty cushy job, though, like ski patrolling, it didn't pay much. I ran the coonskin lift, the one that comes right up out of town. I think it's still operating, though I know they've added the gondola now, too. But in the summer, it was just a tourist thing, and you didn't get all the crazy skiers who fall when they're getting on and off, making you have to stop everything all the time. So running coonskin in the summer was pretty easy, usually anyway. I was working the ski shack at the top of the lift where everyone gets off to either ski back down or go to the next lift, although in the summer everyone was obviously hiking. The altitude of the shack was 10,800 feet. If I recall correctly, it was late July, the time the monsoons start to hit the area. Colorado mountain weather is pretty nice in June, but come midsummer, the monsoons hit which means lots of rain and lightning. Usually, the mornings are nice, but by afternoon, you'd better be off the mountain. So, I was running the lift, and everything was fine, 
just a typical day with a few hikers and sightseers. It wasn't too busy, and I managed to grab some lunch while running the lift. It wasn't long after lunch that my boss showed up to inform me that we were getting a huge bunch of people. Soon, because there was a wedding at the top of the mountain, I was to be extra careful as some of these people would be older and not in such great shape, and I might have to slow the lift down for them to get off. And on top of that, they'd all be in fancy wedding attire with high heels and all that. Some big star of the Miami Dolphins, a fullback, was getting married. Great. I couldn't wait. A bunch of dressed-up city folk trying to ride the coonskin lift, which was very steep and scary. Make my day. I started laughing, but my boss got kind of tense and said this was serious. He knew I could be a smartass, and he knew that big money was something to be respected in Telluride. At least, everyone else seemed to think so. Everyone except the crowd I ran with, that is. I stopped laughing, but I couldn't wipe the grin off my face. All of those people dressed to kill and dangling from a ski lift. My boss decided to stick around and make sure everything went well. It was a big wedding party, about 300 people, a big responsibility for him. I guess he decided he needed to handle it as I wasn't competent enough, even though I'd been running the lift alone for over a month by then. Well, it wasn't long before people started showing up. I didn't know what the coonskin lift capacity is, but I think we had all 300 people on it when what I call the event happened. So, picture a very steep and scary ski lift, the kind with only a bar across the front to hold you in, all crammed up with uppity-dressed people, tuxes and high heels and crazy long dresses and even hats and all. Man, I wish I'd had a camera, because that alone was something I'd never seen before or since. It belonged in a movie. Of course, it took a while to get everyone onto the lift. One chair would come into place, then the lift would stop while people boarded. Then the same thing would happen again. I was at the top, like I said, but I couldn't tell what was happening from how the lift went. I knew it would take a long time to get everyone off when they got up to my lift shack, so during all of this, which was a while, I noticed the sky was getting dark. Clouds were moving in really fast, which is typical for the mountain. My boss was also noting the same thing, and he started looking even more tense. Usually, when the clouds came in, we would just shut the lift down until it all moved through, but no way could we do that with what was going on. Everything seemed to take forever. Getting all these people on the lift was a big deal. I watched as the cloud tendrils began wrapping around higher peaks. Holy crap, I thought. We could be in for a wild ride. Finally, the lift stopped stopping, and I knew everyone was loaded on. Sure enough, here they came. I could see down the slope, and the entire lift was loaded to the gills. There was a huge variety of people, from young to old. Some looked like they were scared to death, and some were laughing and having a great time. The lift began its slow upward climb, just as lightning started popping all around the upper peak. Man, that lift seemed like it was going even slower than normal, but I knew it was just because I wanted it to go fast and get up here before anyone got smacked by lightning. Before long, the lightning was popping all around us. This is when the event happened. My boss and I were both in the lift shack, and he had his hand on the lift mechanism, ready to stop it whenever the first passengers arrived. They were now about two-thirds of the way up the hill. I was looking out the open door at the peaks above me, watching the lightning, when I heard a weird noise coming from my boss. It was literally a scream. If you can imagine a grown man screaming, it scared the crap out of me, and I turned to see what was going on. He was pointing to the lift shack window, but I didn't see anything. He then started kind of babbling while pointing at the window, I stepped out of the shack to see what was going on, and that's when I saw it. By then, it had turned and was loping down the steep hill. I think my boss scared it as much as it scared my boss, because it wasn't wasting any time, and it was running directly down the coonskin run, right under the big wedding party. I knew immediately what it was. 
a Bigfoot. I'd never seen one or even thought of seeing one before. Bigfoot wasn't much of a big deal in Colorado at the time. Since then, there have been more and more sightings, maybe because there are more and more people out and about. I don't know. But it was a sight that etched into my memory. The backside of the Bigfoot running down Coonskin. The creature was enormous and very dark, covered head to toe in what looked like black hair. Not fur like a bear would have, but hair. The hair was long and hung off its arms, which themselves hung down almost to its knees. I couldn't believe how fast this thing was. It was running down Coonskin faster than any Miami Dolphin fullback could possibly run. That thing was moving. As I came back into the lift shack, I noticed my boss had a glazed look on his face. But he was also kind of gesticulating at me as if trying to say something. I think the poor guy was in shock at that point. I quickly noticed what was going on. He'd slammed the lift bar when he saw the Bigfoot and the lift was now going at top speed. Oh man. This was bad, real bad, because I knew it was going to jump track at the speed with that much weight on it. Sure enough, all of a sudden, it stopped with a lurch. The chair swayed back and forth and people yelling. It was such a stunning chain of events, I almost started shaking. Here we were, lightning now popping all around with an inoperable lift crammed with people all dressed for a wedding, many of who were now screaming and yelling as they witnessed a Bigfoot running directly under where they now sat dangling in the air. What a scenario. My boss was now sitting helplessly on the floor, so I took over. I went outside and yelled up at the people closest to me to pass the word down the lift that help was coming. Of course, it wasn't, not yet anyway, but the last thing we needed were people panicking. Many who didn't want to even be on that lift in the first place, especially with lightning popping around. So, I could hear people yelling the message on down the line. I went back into the shack and radioed down to the bottom that we needed help. Before long, I saw an ATV coming up the slope. By now, the Bigfoot had decided to head into the trees and was long gone, leaving only a residue of terror and bafflement. I think a lot of people thought it was some kind of gag. It now started to pour rain again. The guys on the ATZ were soon climbing up the lift tower where the derailment had happened, checking it out. Those guys should have got commendation for taking their lives in their hands, because now the lightning was just crazy. I saw and heard one bolt at the same time. It was that close. They were up there for some time, then came back down, and up to the shack where they informed me that they were going to have to evacuate everyone off the lift. There was no way they could get it back on track. This would be a slow and treacherous process, especially with so many people involved. They radioed down and soon people working for the ski area started coming up the slope. I think there were probably a good 50 or 60 people there helping before it was all over, including a search and rescue team. The ski people brought a bunch of boats and chairs with them that the ski area kept just for this purpose. These little chairs were lightweight and attached to the end of a rope. If you were stuck on the lift, the MO was to get a hold of the boats and chairs and sort of scoot it under you until you were well in it. Then you launch yourself in it and were lowered by whoever was holding the end of the rope. So we now had to throw the boats and chairs over the cable to lower people down with. You would take the chair and start spinning it around your head until it got up a lot of momentum. Then you'd hurl it as hard as you could, hoping it would go over the lift cable. Once you had it over, you were home free, because then you could use it over and over to lower people. We had a minimum of three people holding each rope, acting as a belay while each person was lowered. The person on the lift would slip the chair under them, then... When they were ready, they'd wave or yell at us, and we'd then yell, on belay, and start lowering them, one by one. Many were terrified of getting on the spindly-looking chairs, as the height was really scary, and I didn't blame them. We had several people who refused to even get on the chairs, but we persuaded them by saying it was that or spend the night and who knows how long on the chairlift. That would finally get them moving, but I mean they were scared stiff. As for those of us on the belay end, holding the rope, it was steep terrain and hard to stand up 
especially with a rope around your waist and some scared person on the other end being lowered little by little. It took us four hours to get them all off the lift. By then, the rain had stopped and the storm moved on through, but everyone was still soaked. It was amazing no one was hit by lightning. The ski area had to do something with all these soaked and unhappy people, so they hired the local taxi service to come up. Telluride Taxi had Suburbans at the time, and they drove up the Coonski Snowcat Trail to pick everyone up. The ski area was billed later for this, and I bet it cost them a fortune. By the time it was all over, my boss had recovered somewhat and hiked on back down Coonskin Run without saying one word to me. He told me later that he'd seen this black thing staring in through the shack window at him, no more than ten feet away, with a large, dark face, almost like a human. When I told him that I and everyone on the lift had also seen it, I think it helped a bit. Maybe he wasn't crazy after all. After it was all over, I just stood there, kind of enjoying it all, watching all these people walking in the wet grass in their soaked wedding duds, a lot of the women barefoot as they'd taken off their heels. It seems the majority were kind of having fun, enjoying the adventure, but some people looked outright shocked, mostly the older one. But everyone was talking about the Bigfoot. I think by then everyone thought it was just a big gag someone had contrived for their enjoyment. A few looked really uncomfortable, like they were sure it was real. By the time it was over, it was nearly sunset. The taxis were long gone, so I had to get myself home. I normally would ride the lift down, but now I had to hike down. I didn't want to hike down Coonskin as I was pretty scared by the thought of a Bigfoot around, so I hiked over to the plunge and came down that way. I was glad when I got into town and went home and told my buddies about what had happened. They believed me, so they said anyway. I found out later that the Bigfoot story was soon all over town and I'd become somewhat of an accidental celebrity. I kind of ran with it for a while, as it was all in fun, resulting in some free beer and lots of questioning. All in fun if you hadn't seen the creature and had been scared to death, that is. And in all honesty, I had been scared to death. I didn't do much hiking at all that summer, and when I was out, I was always looking over my shoulder. I was the last one to operate the coonskin lift during the summer, as the gondola went online that year and the coonskin lift is now only open during the winter. What was a Bigfoot doing on coonskin? I think it was hungry and was attracted to the big plastic trash bin up by the snack shack only about 50 feet above the lift shack. I saw a brown bear up there one day just mulling around through the trash and I know they threw a lot of food away there. By the time winter came, I was fine figuring the beast had probably gone somewhere else for the cold season. So I was back on the slope, skiing like a madman, and it was the only time I ever heard of a Bigfoot there. So maybe, like me, it was just wondering what in the heck was going on that wedding day. On to the next one. Hairy upright monsters have been cavorting around in Keaton County, Kentucky since at least 1959 when passing motorists saw one on a bridge in Corvington. Such activity shows no sign of slowing down, yet it would seem. At 7 p.m. on June, a creature appeared to two sportsmen near a frisbee golf course after a long day of competition. The two were walking up from the back of the park when they smelled an odor like a combination of sour meat and wet hair. They dismissed it as a dead animal and continued walking toward the car, which was about 40 yards away. They heard a rustling sound in the thick woods about 20 feet away and peered into the trees, only to see a nine-foot-tall, dark-colored, hairy creature moving parallel with them through the trees. They both stopped dead in their tracks. One of them whispered, What is it? Then the creature let out a blood-curdling, high-pitched shriek that drowned out the sound of all the local fauna. It then started to come towards us in a hunched-over kind of skip. We both took off running for the car, 
with the creature keeping pace behind us. They wasted no gas in getting out of there. They said, one of them looked back and saw the thing standing slouched over the road. It was further described as nine feet tall, with long, shaggy, dark brown hair and arms that reached down to its knees. The eyes were covered with hair, they said, and it ran, slouched over, with bent knees. The two immediately reported the incident to park authorities, but were not believed. An even more recent suspected Bigfoot sighting took place at the evening of November 14, 2006, near Fort Thomas. Around 11.30 that evening, Chris and his companion Liz were sitting on their front porch smoking cigarettes and chatting when they were startled by what sounded like the loud cracking of a large limb or branch breaking. There were dense woods about 20 yards behind the house, but the back porch light was on and they could easily see the tree line but not past the first line of trees. We thought it odd, but wrote it off. To the natural falling of a limb, one witness later stated, After that, because we were then aware of the sounds from the tree, we noticed some rustling and the sound of someone moving around. I yelled, Hey, what you doing back there? Thinking that it was kids trying to spy on us, it continued, and then we heard another limb break further back in the woods. Not as loud as the first, I grabbed a flashlight and walked back to the woods with the intention of looking like a tough guy and yelling at whoever was back there. When I reached the woods, I stood at the tree line and shined the flashlight in and yelled, Hey! It was then that I saw, walking away about 40 feet in front of me, what I thought was a small bear walking on two legs. I got really excited and shouted, hey, to try to get it to turn around, but it didn't. I freaked out and ran back to Liz and we went inside because I wasn't enough of a tough guy to keep smoking cigs outside. Chris later claimed that the thing looked like a small bear, about four to five feet tall, and walked on two legs. He further described it as having a thick body covered with hair. I couldn't see much else because it was dark. In a follow-up interview, the witness stated, the hair was either black or brown and looked shaggy, but I couldn't determine length. It looked like it covered the entire body. No sounds. The only sounds we heard were the breaking of the branches and some rustling that sounded like footsteps. As far as the head and body go, it looked like a bear or a short, stocky person standing up and walking. The stride made it look like it was hobbling a bit. As it was walking away, all I could see was the shaggy hair, not really any visible shape to the head. No smell, no footprint that I could find, but I really didn't look hard. There are a bunch of leaves back there, which is why we could hear it walking and rustling around. It was definitely weird, though. I'll be keeping my eyes peeled towards those woods. A more intimate encounter with one of these hairy inhumanoids came earlier in the year, just outside of Independence. On June 7th, a motorist named Rick and one companion saw a seven-foot-tall, shaggy-looking monster step from the woods directly into the path of the truck they were driving down Kentucky 536 at about 11.30 that evening. Luckily, the truck wasn't traveling at a high rate of speed, according to Rick. The creature walked out of the woods in front of my truck and another truck heading the opposite direction, put its hands on the hood of my truck, and then kept walking into the woods on the other side of the road. The eyewitness was adamant that the thing walked upright like a man and not some animal. My dog was in the truck, he said, and started acting strange before the creature even walked out. When asked if he could remember anything further about the encounter, he stated, I was going about 20 miles per hour, 
accelerating off a turn going uphill. I had to slam on my brakes. I didn't find any prints on my hood, but it did stick its hand out and appear to look at me, but I couldn't make out any features. The truck in the oncoming lane hit its high beams, and I couldn't see much then. Just a big, hairy, upright thing crossing the road. Another Kenton County resident, who wishes to remain anonymous, believes he was in the presence of the elusive Bigfoot on June 19, 2007, as he was working in his garden in Taylor Mills, Kentucky. It was just about 7 p.m. when the incident occurred. I was weeding in my garden. Then I heard someone walking in the woods, he said. The footsteps were steady, but far apart. They sounded like they were coming from an extremely tall, very heavy human. We don't have any giants here in Taylor Mill that I know about. And it was definitely someone or something on two feet. I kept hearing the footsteps and stood up to see if I could see who was making them. I could see nothing. An uneasy feeling came over him, and he admitted that he was a bit freaked out by the peculiar sounds coming from whatever it was out there. He was relieved to realize that the sounds were not coming in his direction. He stood there, he said, and listened as the footsteps faded in the distance, then left the area. Knox County has a long history of phenomena of all types. Small wonder that a hairy humanoid monster reports can be found here as well. Captain Thomas Mantell, a decorated World War II pilot, met his death while chasing an unidentified flying object through the sky over Fort Knox, Kentucky. In October 1976, a hair-covered man-like monster was seen by a soldier in the woods just outside Fort Knox Army Base. I was 17 years old in the U.S. Army basic training at Fort Knox, Kentucky, and we were spending three days in the woods for biovac training. Our tents were still up in a circular fashion in a small clearing. It was pre-dawn, about 4.30 a.m. It was cold that morning, he recalled, and threatened to rain. After walking about a hundred yards through moderate brush to breakfast, the witness and his training company were enjoying their breakfast when he realized that he'd left his gloves behind in the pup tent. Fearing punishment by the drill sergeant, I told a buddy that I was going to run back to the tent area to retrieve them. I figured that I would be right back and the drill sergeant would never miss me. He took off by himself through the dark. No flashlights were allowed for tactical reasons. As they approached his tent, he noticed a figure standing on the other side, bent over at the weight, apparently looking for something in the tall grass, some only six to eight feet away. Thinking it was another recruit who had forgotten or lost something, he yelled a greeting at the figure, but... There was no response. Puzzled, he repeated the greeting and was met once more only by silence. He yelled loudly then and the dark figure stood up and faced him. The darkness precluded him from seeing any detail. He said, but he immediately got the creeps. The two stood facing each other for about ten seconds. Then a faint light from a distant truck struck the figure. It illuminated the thing for only about a second, which was long enough. In that second, and from no more than eight feet away, he said, I observed this creature to have hair which was similar in color and texture of that of an Irish sir dog, which covered its upper body. Due to the tall grass and the tent in between us, I was unable to see its legs. It also had black or very dark eyes, and it was human-like, yet not, and it did not appear to have a distinct neck. It did not make any sound. Now, thoroughly alarmed, he slowly began backing away from the tent, trying not to alarm the beast. After three steps, he said, he panicked and ran as fast as he could 
back through the woods toward the rest of the recruits, completely forgetting about his gloves. He suffered the consequences of forgetting them just as he knew he would, and no one believed him when he tried to tell his story. So he quickly stopped speaking about the matter. He further described the creature as six and a half feet tall, covered in reddish-brown shaggy hair and powerfully built. It had a very short neck, if any at all, he said, and dark eyes with human-like characteristics. Another creature was seen by four children in a backyard in Flat Lick, Kentucky. My brother, two cousins, and myself ran up on a Bigfoot, one of them later proclaimed. They were in the yard around 5 p.m. when they startled the thing, getting as close as five feet away from the beast. It was walking away from us. It was on its hind legs, walking upright. It was dark brown in color, and it had hair about four to five inches long. It had its arms outstretched about chest level. It slowly walked away from us as if it didn't see us. Stunned, the group watched the creature walk away in that strange fashion. They didn't tell their parents for a long time because they knew they wouldn't believe them. The thing was further described as brown in color, about seven feet tall, with a powerful build. No breasts were noticed, so the witnesses assumed that it was a male. The man-beast made another Knox County appearance on July 14, 1999, to a group of frightened berry pickers. It was about 1 a.m. when the alleged encounter took place. It was midsummer, and the group had been picking blackberries all day, so they decided to camp at the location to get an early start that next morning. They built a good-sized campfire, and everyone went to sleep. Later, they were awakened by the sounds of something large crashing through the woods. My cousin was so scared he couldn't move, one of them later claimed. It sounded like someone was running in circles around us, knocking down small trees. Our fire had almost burned out by this time, but I could just make out a large, man-like figure at least seven or eight feet tall. We heard a low, grumbling noise the whole time. They could also smell a rotten stench. This was too much for them, and they all quickly got up and ran nearly a mile out of the patch, not even stopping for a breath. They could hear the thing running behind them as they fled. This thing, whatever it was, could have caught us at any time. The next morning, we returned to find many small trees downed and a new path ripped through the briar patch. Where I live is pretty rugged terrain, so you would believe anything could be out there. This is how my first sighting occurred. It was about 2 p.m. in the middle of April. I was running through our garden with a BB gun, just shooting around, being a kid, when I ran out of our garden and jumped up on this big rock that was on top of this ravine that led down into this hollow. At the top of this mountain, a small drainage ditch ran into it where I was at. I jumped up on this rock and said, bang. Well, when I did, I heard a branch break on the right of me. The witness turned and found that he was only about 13 feet away from a very strange and frightening animal, which stood on two legs. He described it as about five feet tall, with hair that resembled a rabbit in color, but was long. It was standing kind of hunched over like a bodybuilder would do when showing his ab. It also had a pointed head, but I don't remember seeing a face. It turned and ran through the wood, away from me, and I turned and ran away from it and who could blame him? He could hear the thing breaking limbs as it retreated behind him. He ran into the house and grabbed a real shotgun, excitedly telling the story to his mother. She could see he was serious, so she grabbed her own gun and followed him back outside. We got back there, and I found lots of big branches that had been broken, 
and a lot of slide marks on the hillside. As I walked the little spillway that meets the ravine, I found a very discernible footprint on the bank. It was about a size six shoe, because that is what my mom's shoe size is, and we had it there for comparison. Oddly enough, the human-looking footprint only had three toes. The sighting allegedly took place on Highway 229. A small, gorilla-like creature was seen by another witness and his girlfriend while out four-wheeling down 1189. It was standing on all fours, resembling a small gorilla. The witness estimated its height at around four feet at the shoulders and its weight at about a hundred pounds. According to him, the creature's face was white like a skull and flat with no visible ears and no apparent neck. Its hair was reddish-orange, like that of an orangutan. It crawled across a fallen tree as the witness watched and disappeared. The witness also claimed that he had seen a similar creature previously in the area, which is a remote and very dense stretch of bottomland along the Laurel River. I was walking down a trail surrounded by about 40 acres of wood near a pond and a small stream, said London, Kentucky resident David G. It was just after 3.30 a.m. on the morning of May. I heard leaves crunching behind me and turned around and did not see a thing. I walked a little further and smelled the worst smell I have ever smelled. It smelled like I was in a swamp. I heard the leaves crunching again beside me. I looked and saw it. It was probably 15 or 20 feet away. It stared at me for about 30 seconds, and I ran towards the house, which is about a quarter mile down the trail. I haven't went back since. What David claimed he saw was a huge, 10-foot-tall, hair-covered creature. It had long arms and a large head and a flat face, a big body, and was covered with black hair except for its head, which was covered in brown hair. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!